The scripture reading for today will be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 17, and will be read by Miss Wee Sufen. Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 17. The Church and its Leaders Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? After all, what is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God, who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as a wise builder. And when someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light, and it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. This is the word of the Lord. Church, the peace of the Lord be with you. It's good to be able to come together to hear God's word. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for the privilege of being called after your name to be your people, to come together to worship you, Almighty God. And, this, and, and today we also, at this time, turn to you, turn to your word and pray that you will speak to our hearts from your word. You bless our hearts, you bless our lives, you enrich our lives, we pray, that we may continue to grow in Jesus Christ our Lord and bring glory and honour to you in the way that we live. We pray this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of our church. Amen. Long ago I heard this uh, story about these three little boys. It seems uh, each one of them were claiming that their father was the greatest. The first boy said, you know, my father is the greatest. He, when, when he asks people to open their mouths, they open. When he says close, they close. When he says rinse your mouth, they rinse their mouth. At the end of it, they all pay my father money and then they go off. My father is the greatest. It seems the next boy said, no, 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 my father is actually the greatest. He can turn people's head any way he likes. He even cuts off their hair. And at the end of it all, they pay him money and they go off. My father is the greatest. It seems the third boy said, ah, no, no, no. My father is actually the greatest. When my father says stand, everybody stands. When my father says sit, everyone sits. And after my father has spoken for a while. He sends out empty bags to the people and they all fill it up with money and return it to my father. My father is the greatest. You know, I say this to tell us that like those three little boys that I've just described to you, the, the, the Corinthian Christians were something like that. They were also boasting of their leaders uh, saying that, the, the leader that they have aligned themselves with is the greatest. 
And uh, they were thinking of church in terms of who belongs to whom and who baptized who. And so the result was they were having a false view of the church and a false view of the church leadership as well. And because they were thinking in these terms and talking in very unspiritual ways, the Apostle Paul refers to them in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. He puts it like this. He says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. In other words, he's saying to them, look, if you talk in these terms, the way you're talking and comparing leaders, pitting one against the other and aligning yourself to, to leaders and calling themselves, uh, uh, calling yourselves great because your leaders are great and so on. Paul is saying that, you know, you, you are carnal, you are unspiritual, you are worldly. The term he uses is you are as people of the flesh. No, another way of saying the same thing is that they were infants in Christ, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Why does he call them infants? Because he says, if you look at verse 2, he says, I fed you with milk, not solid food. This is very typical. Infants have to be on milk, not solid food. And then in verse 3, he says that, you know, you are, you are infants, you, you are people of the flesh, because he says, um, verse 3, for, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? You are spiritually immature. You are quarreling, there is jealousy among you. And you know, quarreling and jealousy and all of that means that uh, I mean, I, I, these things mean that this is of sinful nature. Your sinful nature, the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian Christians. And the Apostle then moves on to give three pictures or three images of the church. Now the implication of those images that he's giving to us are very, very important. They show us that the church is actually built by God, not by people. The church is built by God. Now, I want to apply it in such a way that we learn that the church, that we learn what the church should be. Because when God builds the church, He has a particular purpose. We learn that He builds it. We want to know why He builds it. And that will then tell us what kind of a church we must be, what kind of a people of God that we must be. The first is, he says, the church is God's field. God is the one who gives growth to the church. And we see that in verses, uh, in chapter 3, verses 5 to 9. But let me read verse 4 onwards. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. One planted, another water, but God is the one who gives the growth. In fact, the Greek here is actually God is the one who continually gives growth. God keeps giving them growth. And so God alone gives growth to the seed, as he puts it in verse 6. You see, leaders are important, of course. You know, but leaders are instruments in the hands of God. They are servants of God. But God, of course, works through them. God assigns ministries to them. 
and they carry out the ministry. God involves us in the work. But the one who actually gives the growth is God. No matter how hard we work, the growth is not from us. The one who blesses the work, the one who blesses the ministry is God and He gives the growth. We must never forget that. You know, because sometimes as leaders and leaders of the church, we tend to forget who we actually are, that we are called by God. And sometimes when we see the church grow, things begin to happen. We forget that it is God who gives the growth and that the church belongs to God. So it is therefore important that we realize who we are. At best, we are servant leaders. Even when people refer to us as leaders, we must always remember, even if they forget, we must remember that we are at best servant leaders. We are actually unworthy servants. Uh, so we, we must know how to carry ourselves. You know, we, we must know who we are. We are here to serve. A few years ago, I, I was told this, uh, uh, I, there was an incident that was related to me by someone I know. He said to me that he was in this international uh, meeting, just, just a few years ago. He was in this international meeting. And um, in, in the meeting, it was some kind of an intense meeting and uh, there was a lot of minutes to be taken and uh, everybody in the meeting was uh, a leader. All of them were leaders. And, and so as they went into the meeting, they said, look, we, we, got to, we, we need someone who, who need to take the minutes down. You know, we need somebody to record all that is going on, all, all that we are, we are saying to each other. And they said, just nobody wanted to do that because uh, the very next day, the minutes must be uh, made ready and presented in the very next meeting, which was the next morning. So nobody really wanted to do that. And it seems there was this very un unassuming man, you know, de definitely because they were all leaders, so everybody knew he was some kind of a leader, but very unassuming person. And it seems he said, okay, never mind. I, I will take the minutes. I will get it sorted out. I will present it to all of you, uh, to all of us tomorrow morning. You see, it was later that they found out this man, this unassuming leader, was actually an archbishop. You know, he he realized, you know, he he was there in this international meeting and all that, but he realized that he is a servant leader. We must never forget what we are there to do, who we are. And who gives the growth? At best, like I said, we are servant leaders. You know, that, that whole incident, I, I will, I, I've never been able to put that out of my mind. It, it, it says something to me about how people view leadership. And the Bible knows no leadership but servant leadership. We are first in line as leaders but then we are first in line to serve. So we must be careful not to put ourselves forward. We must be careful not to compete with one another. We must be careful that we do not contribute to divisiveness. We do not cause divisiveness. We must not bring about division into the church community life. The Apostle Paul and there was Apollos, they were not thinking of themselves greater. They were not competing with one another. But the people in the church tended to say that this is a greater leader than the other leader and then they were creating uh, divisiveness among themselves. You see, all of us who are called to serve must know that we are servants in actual fact. And we are here to serve and do those things that God has assigned to us to do. And God gives the growth. Second lesson is this, the church is God's building. And we see that in um, 
verses 9 to 15. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that Christ alone is the foundation of the church. In, in verse 11, he, he, he puts it like this. He says, uh, let, let, me, let me take it from verse 9, the, sec, the last bit of it, and then go on to 10 and 11 and so on. You are God's field, God's building, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test that sort of work each one has done. If the work that has, anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is, is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Christ alone is the foundation of the church. And if, if you build a community on anything else or on anyone else other than Jesus Christ our Lord, that would not be a church. If it is a church, it must be built on Jesus Christ as the foundation. And the builders must be careful of the materials they use. Wood, stray, uh, straw, hay. These are actually uh, perishable materials. So when, when we build the, the, the church, which is a called out people of God, we must ask what kind of ground are we building on, what piling work needs to be done, therefore what materials will we use in constructing the, 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 the people, I mean, not the building. Yeah. And so we, we need to be careful on, on what we are building. Not wood, stray, hay or straw, but gold, silver, precious stones. You see, basically this is just a, com uh, a comparison between perishing materials and, and, and materials that cannot perish. Imperishable materials. Basically that's about what the Apostle Paul is doing here. To, to say to us, we need to be careful how we are building the people of God. So what should the church be? It should be a community built on Christ. And Christ is the right foundation for the church. And if we build on personalities, we will regret it. Because personalities will not always be around. Uh, personalities may make mistakes, commit sins, stumble people, and that will be disastrous. In fact, even now around us, we see ministries that have been uh, built around personalities, even churches that have been built around personalities. They are in trouble, some of them. They are collapsing, some of them. Some of them have collapsed. Churches and Ministry, Christian ministries collapsed because they were built on personalities other than Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the right foundation. And we must build with sound biblical teachings, which is the right material to use to build the people of God, not on false teaching, not on the wisdom of the world, you see, those who build on false teachings and worldly wisdom, they will lose their reward in heaven, as verse 15, the Apostle Paul very clearly says to us. He says, uh, if anyone, anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So think about that. Yeah, think about that. And so we need to take the Bible seriously read it carefully, study it meticulously, teach it while applying it in our lives all the time. And I pray that we as a church, we as a church, you and I, will equip our members 
to know the Bible, to understand the Bible, and to live out the Bible in their daily lives. This is what we want to do. This is what the church should be all about. That all of our time should be spent doing this. Most of our time. Yeah? And then equipping the people for ministries as a result. But unfortunately, we see that this is not what we are doing. We are doing something else. I don't know what we are doing, but many churches seem to be doing something else rather than building up the people with the word of God. I remember just a few years ago, in, in, in recent times really, there was this uh, anti-Christian seminar, I call it, in one of the universities. And uh, it was about two hours of talk. And then at the end of it, whoever was giving the talk told the people, if you want to embrace our faith, give up whatever faith you are in, come forward. And among the, groups of, uh, among the group of people who went forward, there were a few I was reliably told, very reliably told, a few of them were actually Christians who were actually in the worship team. And they couldn't even handle two hours of onslaught. They stood up on their own accord, went forward and embraced something else because they had not understood the Christian faith. The church has not taught them sufficiently the Christian faith, but they are in the worship team. They have not been taught enough. It's very sad. I, do, I don't say this judgmentally, but it is extremely sad to hear of such incidents. My friends, why build our churches so beautiful? When in actual fact, there's no depth in spiritual lives of our people, of our members. You know, it is said, uh, George Carey, uh, sorry, William Carey, who is the father of modern missions, the church that he comes from the church that he came from in England. You know, from England, he went over to India. Did tremendous work there. Translated the Bible, reached out to the people and all of that. But the church that sent him into the mission field, and, uh, and as a result, later on, he came to be known as the father of modern missions. That church now is a temple. The church now is a temple. You want to think about that? You want to think about that? If we don't work to build spiritual depth in the believers, we are really wasting time putting up church buildings and uh, doing anything else and everything else. We need to teach what we believe. We need to teach why we believe and how to live our Christian lives. This is of utmost importance. Thirdly, the Apostle Paul says that he refers to the church as a temple. In verses 16, 17, he says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit indwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple and you are that temple you see in the old testament the temple is a building but in the new testament the temple is the is the people of god you see when we come to jesus christ our lord when we come to christ at that point at that very point the the, the holy spirit of god is given to us we are marked with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, as the Apostle Paul tells us in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is given to us. And therefore here he says that we then become the temple of God. Each one of us, the temple of God, because the Holy Spirit indwells us. 
And because God's Spirit indwells us and indwells our Christian community, therefore the Christian and the church must be a holy community. So we must be careful, brothers and sisters in Christ, we must be careful not to dishonor the temple in any way. Not to dishonor the Spirit of God who indwells us. Divisions, rivalries, jealousies, false teachings, immoral conduct will not build up the temple of God. It will not build us up individually. It will not build our community up. It will not build the Christian community up. And so in this respect, there are two areas of our lives that we need to guard. You know, we, we need to live exemplary lives in the way that we live. You know, th this is so very important. We need to apply biblical values even in uh, tough situations that we may be in at our workplace. You know, to, to be careful that we do not compromise on our Christian faith. We need to impact people around us, wherever we might be in, whether at workplace, at study place, anywhere. And secondly, we need to build strong marriages and we need to raise up strong Christian families. We find that marriage is greatly under attack all over the world and including here in our country. We are not spared either. Marriage is greatly under attack. Families are actually breaking down at very alarming rate, even in our country. What can the church do? I can think of uh, things like the uh, marriage course offered by Alpha, you know, uh, focus on the family that also offers a lot of Christian materials to, to, to strengthen marriages, to, to build strong families. We, we need to introduce this. We need to take these materials, use them, teach them, learn from them in our churches. In this way, we equip our people to face the challenges, to live out God-honoring lives, individually, through our marriage, through our families, uh, whether we are married, whether we are singles, whatever. To live for the glory and honor of God. See, there's a warning in verse 17. Verse 17 says that uh, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. To destroy the church by causing disunity, by lying to the church, uh, by bringing into the church that which is false and that which is immoral, these are extremely serious offenses. You know, when we act against God's church, we are actually acting against God Himself. And when we act against the church, by, by bringing in what is not right, what is not pleasing to God, what is immoral, what is of the world and so on. God is not going to just sit down and watch, my friends. God is going to deal with it very, very seriously. We need to take this warning here in verse 17 extremely seriously. Now, let me conclude by saying this. that We must not come to church fighting about personalities or even putting ourselves forward as greater than others. We must not come to church fighting about methods, money, programs in the church. You know, at, 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 at best, you know, programs and methods and all that, they are secondary. You know. But if I were to choose a church to go to, my criteria will not be what program they have or what method they use or who is leading it. That, 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 that will not be my, 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 my thing. If I were to choose to go to church, I mean, if I were to choose a church to go to, I would ask myself, this church that I'm choosing, 
Can I grow into Christ likeness in this church? By going to this church, will I become more and more like Christ? Is Jesus preached in this church? Are the doctrines of this church correct? Is re repentance emphasized in this church? Are holy lives lived out in the life of this church? These will be my, my, my questions about the church that I would choose to want to go to. Not methods and programs or who is leading it or the personality and so on. See, the church is founded for the glory of God. And so we who belong to the church, we must commit ourselves to growing in Jesus Christ our Lord. God gives the growth, but we have our part to play. And we must help others to grow. Some plant, some water, God gives the growth. And we must do our part to bring growth into the lives of people. And we must have Christ as at the center of our lives. And you and I must live daily for the honor of God. Uh, we must live God honoring lives in a way that is pleasing to the Almighty God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your church. We pray your blessing, Lord, upon this church. We pray your goodness to just surround this church, that the church will experience your blessings and your power, Lord, at work in their lives. That every one of them will grow into maturity in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray to you in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord, that we will live lives that are pleasing to you, that are honoring you. And the people may be able to see Christ in us and that we are a church that is united, living for Christ, living in Christ, living in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So we pray your blessing upon our church. We pray your blessing upon every person in this church, whether they are single, whether they are married, whether they are adults, they are children, they are youths, young adults, senior people in the church. I command all of them into your hands. I also pray for good health for every one of them. In this season of the pandemic, our Father, we pray that grant to all of us good health. Keep us safe under your protective arms and grant to us your blessings upon us and upon our church, upon our loved ones near and far. This we pray for the glory and honor of your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.